second scripture comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 40 to 45. A leper came to him, begging him, and kneeling, he said to him, If you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly, but stayed out in the country. And people came to him from every corner. What an odd passage. And I can tell how odd I think it is because I went back through my database. I've never preached on this passage once. So here we have something that happens in Mark a lot. Mark does this. None of the other gospel writers have this, this kind of... Uh, thing happen where Jesus will heal someone and then turn around and tell them not to tell anyone. But of course, in the Gospel of Mark, every time that happens, we know exactly what happens. They run off and tell everyone. And so the question is, what's, what's going on here? One scholar back in the late um, 1800s, early 20th century, uh, came up with a description of this that he called it Mark's Messianic Secret. And scholars have argued for centuries about what is going on here, why this happens. And, and they've come up with lots of different answers, some of which are satisfying, some of which are not. You can choose. Some say Jesus was using reverse psychology. He actually wanted them to go out and tell everyone, and he figured, if I tell them not to tell anyone, they're going to go out and tell everybody. I don't know. Some say that um, Jesus was realizing that it wasn't quite his time yet to be revealed as Messiah, and so being moved with, with pity and, and wanting to, to help these folk, but knowing that it wasn't quite the right time for everybody to know about him, he said, okay, I'll, I'll heal you, but don't tell anybody. Some say he was just trying to avoid becoming the latest celebrity healer. That everyone would know, oh, that guy that heals lepers is in town. Let's all go. Some argue that he was trying to keep his enemies from knowing that he was in the area. If they found out that he had been healing people, they would know where he was and come and find him. Some argue that because it was an honor-shame society, and, and it really was a culture that was, was set up in such a way that if one person received honor, they could only get that if someone else was shamed. And that Jesus, in, in telling people to be quiet, was trying to avoid falling into that situation where he would be honored for healing someone and everyone else would be shamed because they had not been able to do that. Some argue that what we're really looking at here is some kind of a mistranslation from the Aramaic Jesus, of course, spoke Aramaic. Mark was written in Greek, and they argue that by the time it got to the Greek, the people screwed it up, and really Jesus had been saying something else. But that, of course, is just a guess, because nobody has the original Aramaic words. Some argue that it was a literary piece, and, and refers to the stories of Odysseus, where he had to hide himself and fake who he was to keep his enemies from finding him. 
Others say that Mark was puzzled when he looked at Jesus and, and he couldn't figure out why Jesus wasn't doing the things that everybody thought he was supposed to be doing as Messiah. And so Mark added these words into Jesus' mouth, these folks say, as a way of trying to explain why he wasn't doing what they wanted him to do just yet. Now, I'm the pastor. I've got the answers, right? You ready? I have no idea. Thank you. <laughs> and frankly, I'm not particularly concerned about not having any idea. It, it's clearly a central theme in, in Mark, and it's a central theme in this passage. It was the first thing that I noticed, and I'll bet it was that you noticed too. When you look at that whole little pericope and you've got this little piece there in the middle, Jesus heals him and immediately says, don't tell anyone. That was what caught my imagination. But I think if we get caught there, we miss out on some other possibilities. And so that's where I'm going to go with it. You can, you can get caught there if you want. Um, but for me, I'm going to play with another piece that I see in this passage. First, some details. Leprosy in the Bible is not the disease that we think of. Hansen's disease, or at least it's not only that. It's more a catch-all term that refers to any kind of skin problem that, that uh, could range from ringworm all the way to Hansen's disease and everything in between. Fungal diseases, bacterial infections, viral things, all kinds of stuff fell into this word, this category of leprosy. Some were horrific. Some were relatively benign. All of them rendered you unclean. So in terms of your, your place in the larger community, it didn't matter if you had ringworm or Hansen's disease. The result was the same. You were ostracized. You were sent not to the edge of society, but beyond the edge of society. You were unclean. If you were a woman, you couldn't hang out at the well with the other women and talk about what was going on that day. If you were a vendor, you couldn't sell your wares. If you walked through the town, you had to shout, leper, leper, so everyone would know you were coming and could avoid even the possibility of being touched by you. You couldn't go to worship and, and ask for prayer for healing because you couldn't go there. And, and, and if you would come and, and sat down in the chair in the front of the church, to come and get prayer, that made that chair unclean, and anybody who sat in it became unclean. You were pushed away. Your family, your spouse, your children, your parents turned away from you, lest they become unclean as well. Even if they didn't catch the disease, and, and they weren't sure whether that might happen, but even if they didn't catch the disease, all they needed to do was touch you or touch something that you had touched. And they became, likewise, unclean, cut off from society. And that disease became your defining characteristic. You were no longer Ron or Jean or Dovey. You were leper. And there you were. Now, there was a process for coming back into the community because if, obviously, if it, if it covered that wide, wide range of diseases, some of them we know just go away eventually on their own. Maybe even occasionally someone found some way to find healing from one of the more, more uh, devastating illnesses. But in any case, there was a way to get back in. You'd go to the priest and the priest would examine you. 
And, and maybe they'd make you come back another time for another examination. But if you showed up clean, you would make an offering, and then everything was good. You could come back into society. Given all of that picture, it's kind of amazing this leper had the courage to approach Jesus. Because, again, if he got too close, if he touched Jesus by mistake, he would render Jesus unclean, and that just wasn't something you wanted to be accused of having done. But the leper comes. Presumably, is, this person is completely and absolutely desperate, looking for some kind of hope, for some kind of possibility, and comes to Jesus and begs, please, if you want, you could make me clean. Now, it's interesting, our, our passage said that Jesus was moved with pity. There, there is another variant of the text that says Jesus was moved with anger. Was he angry that the person had the gall to come and get in his way? Was he angry that the person had been ostracized and pushed out of community? We don't know. Obviously, folk like the pity variant in the text better, and that's the one that almost all of ours have. But that's a better picture, an easier picture of Jesus. But in any case, Jesus heals him. He says, you're right. I can do it. You're healed. Now go to the priest, do the stuff you're supposed to do, but don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. It seems a bit much to ask, doesn't it? I mean, coming back into a society, people are going to notice. If, if he walks in the door and yells out, Lucy, I'm home! <laughs> She's going to say, what? If he shows up in the marketplace the next day, all of his old friends who haven't seen him for years, perhaps, all of these folk are going to notice, hey, he's back. He must be clean now. He must be clean now. Something had to have happened. What happened? Well, I can't tell you. What do you mean you can't tell me? He told me not to tell you. What do you mean he told you not to? What happened? That's just silliness, isn't it? And of course, there is tied with that the excitement of finally being able to come back. Lucy, I'm home! Look at me, look at me, I'm clean. There's no more, I, I, I'm here. Jesus, touch, oops. <laughs> and so the leper does just what everyone would expect. The former leper does just what everyone would expect and tells this story of healing, of restoration, of hope, realize who in the world could blame. But, Jesus. The people hear this story, and they all come running. All of them wanting something from him. <clears throat> they want to be the next one to get the miracle. And so they push and they shove, and I can all hear, Me, Jesus, me! It's my turn. Now, whether Mark strays into hyperbole here or not, we're not quite sure, but he says, it was so bad, Jesus couldn't even go into a town openly any longer. And so he stays out in the countryside, and even there, they keep coming, and they keep coming. As I played with it over the last couple of weeks, this passage, two aphorisms came to mind. The first one is, no good deed goes unpunished. The second one might seem a little odd to you, though, where it came from. And that is, if a church has a, bu a budget surplus, it must be doing something wrong. <laughs> if a church has a budget surplus, it must be doing something wrong. Now, I've heard that, that aphorism again and again and again since my days in seminary mostly from clergy. And 
Of course, whenever somebody says that, almost always it's someone who's at a church where they're struggling with their budget. And, and one of the answers that comes, predictably comes, is, well, that's just an excuse for poor stewardship. It's an excuse for poor stewardship on the part of the members of the congregations. If they gave more, there wouldn't be a problem with the budget. And it's an excuse for poor stewardship on the part of the board. If, if they were better at managing their resources, maybe you would have a budget surplus. And, and there's some truth in, in both of those, perhaps. But there still is something that is very true in the aphorism itself. If a church does, if a church has a budget surplus, it's doing something wrong because there are lots and lots of needs out there that need to be addressed. And if you've got resources and you're not trying to address them, you're abdicating your responsibility. There's always more ministry to be done. That's, that's my takeaway from this passage, that there was always somebody else for Jesus to heal. So much so that it felt like a weight on his shoulders. So much so that he wasn't able to meet every need. That it was more than even Jesus could do. There is always more ministry to be done. Sometimes the needs are obvious, aren't they? If you try to drive to the east of Santa Barbara on 101 these days. I'm, I'm told it's starting to get a little better, but for a while there, everybody was slowing down to look to see what they could see in Montecito. You couldn't see very much from the 101, but once you got off the road even just a little bit, you could see the devastation that was still there. And of course, me going the other direction west, what I saw every single day and still see is a parade of dump trucks carrying debris. Truck after truck after truck after truck. Sometimes the needs are obvious. If you walk down State Street and you see the number of homeless folk who are sitting there, it's obvious that there are some problems. Even come and come by the church some evening after 8 o'clock and notice that there are two cars parked here with two people sleeping in them. <clears throat> you came out this past Wednesday to the gathering and learned about showers of blessing. You learned about needs that are obvious. And, and sometimes if you run into someone, those needs are very obvious, aren't they? That they need a shower badly. And that's a piece of human dignity and, and, and cultural necessity just to, to survive. Sometimes the needs are less obvious. I heard the other week um, something that both made me laugh and cry. The government in the UK has established an official position, the Minister of Loneliness. A government position. Because looking at their society, they saw that there were way too many people who were completely isolated. And, and as they were doing this, this story on the BBC and they were interviewing people, they interviewed an elderly woman and she said, it's not unusual for me to go a week without talking to another person. And I could go longer than that if I didn't push myself to go out and go to the grocery store just so I can see another person and answer their question when they say, debit or credit. And so that loneliness, is that real? I, I wonder in our community how many people there are who have no human connections. And how easy it is to not see that. How many people spend all of their time and energy just trying to make ends meet while their spirits shrivel up and die? couldn't help but think of, of Thoreau's statement of the vast mass of people live lives of quiet desperation. How many people live lives of quiet desperation? 
And doesn't it strike you as amazing that it was that long ago during Thoreau's life that he saw that and how much worse it must be now? <coughs> and how does that desperation feed into the unspeakable violence of our culture? Do you know there were 300 mass shootings last year? That's almost one a day. And if you watch the news, it feels like we're right on target again this year. To the point that we don't even mention it anymore because it's so, so very common. People don't get upset or excited. Oh, five more people killed in Kentucky, man. Just another day, just another gun. I could go on. I don't know about you, I'm starting to feel a little dispirited about it. And overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. How do you begin to address all of those needs? How do you begin? And we remember that Jesus couldn't do it all. He didn't heal everybody. There were folk who came and didn't get touched. There were folk who were so sick they weren't able to come. There were folk who were so depressed they didn't even have hope that he would speak to them, and so they just stayed home. And even when he tried, he gets burned out. We read again and again that he, he goes off into the wilderness to escape, to find respite. He, he says to his friends, come on with me, let's go and pray. I need somebody to lift me up and hold me up because I am just burned out. And then he goes back into the fray to do more. To touch one more person, to heal one more person. To do a little more good. And, and that's what I take from today's passage. That we can do the same, that we won't be able to meet all the needs, even of the folk in this little congregation. And you know that. There have been times, I'll bet, when you've been sitting here and think, you know what, this church just isn't doing for me what I need today. And we know there are certainly times when that's true for other members of the congregation. And that's before we even get outside these walls. And of course, that's where our call really is, isn't it? And, 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 and to start addressing all of the needs, the hidden ones here in, in well-off Goleta and the not-so-hidden ones all around us. We can't meet them all. It's silly to expect us to meet them all, but we can make a difference, and we do. And, and, and sometimes, again, it's in ways that we don't quite think of. I, I was thinking this week about Goleta Valley Nursery School and how often we forget that it is our outreach and how often Goleta Valley Nursery School doesn't even know that it's our outreach. But every family that's touched by that ministry is a family whose life is made richer and deeper or, and fuller. And, and some kid who knows, you know what? I'm loved even by folk who aren't members of my family. And some of those kids, some of the kids are hard to love. Some come with all kinds of problems. Some because of genetics, some because of their way their family functions or doesn't function, some who knows why. But they know they are loved. And, and it's, it's, it's heartbreaking because when a kid leaves our school for whatever reason, I watch the teachers cry. And, and I've seen it happen when they go to a parent and they say, this child has psychological issues that we cannot address. They need to be somewhere with a lot more intensive help. And then the child leaves, and they cry. They cry. That's us, folk. That's us. 
As simple as opening the Red House to a 12-step program, and someone gets touched there. As simple as opening this space for a recital, and some teenage violinist gets to stand up and play in a room that sounds so good. And, and those are things that are little things that we do. Maybe it's someone watching a sermon online. I have no idea who watches them. A couple people do every week. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe once someone watches that online and says, that's just what I needed to hear today. Maybe it's one of you who gets inspired to go out into the community and do real ministry. And, and a lot of that's really quiet. I see it, though, and I am astounded at more of you than I could begin to say, at what you do and how you do it. My, my children's sermon, if we'd had some kids here today, as you know, Corwin is really sick, and the other kids who show up are here and not here, and that's just what it is. But I was going to tell the, 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 the little fable or the little story of the starfish on the beach. You know, there was this horrible swarm, and all of these thousands and thousands and thousands of starfish got washed up on the beach way beyond, beyond the, the normal high water line. And, and they were baking in the sun, and they were dying. And there was a little boy walking down the beach one at a time, picking up the starfish and throwing them back into the ocean. And some very helpful adult with good intentions said, you know, you, you really can't make a difference. There's thousands and thousands of them. They're all just going to die. It's just go home and play. Do something else. And the kid with the wisdom that only a kid can have picked up the one starfish and said, it makes a difference for this one. And threw it into the water. And, and that's what this passage tells us. Jesus didn't heal everybody, but he healed that one leper. And then another, and another, and another, and another, as many as he could. You and I can't meet all of the needs, even in this congregation, let alone in this wider community, let alone in this world that is so broken. But we can make a difference. A little bit, by little bit, by little bit, by little bit. And it makes a difference, and it means something. And in the end, God's kingdom comes. Amen.